Um, I was born in Ghana. So I did my basic education in JSS in Ghana. Then I moved to America to pursue my education. So I started high school in America in the Bronx and I graduated in 2007. Then I moved to upstate New York, Binghamton University to do my bachelor's in chemistry. Then I moved to Ohio to do my PhD at Ohio State University. And then I started working right after my PhD. I used to work at one university called Ohio Dominican University. And now I'm back at my alma mater, Ohio State University. And so presently I'm a faculty there and I also do my side business. I'm a consultant, educational consultant. I help students, high school students, especially prepare for college because I believe the earlier you prepare, the better it will be for you. So I want to make this engaging. If you are here, please let me know what topic made you attend the workshop today. Is it number one? So comment your number in the chats. Is it how to pick the best college? Is it how to decide your major? Which one uh, made you um, decide to attend the conference today? I just want to comment it in the chat. Let me see where people are so I can spend more time on that particular topic. Let me see. So comment it in the chat. Put your number one, two, and three all. OK. I like that, five, all right, which is scholarships, five and seven, no problem, number one, okay. Excellent, I think that we have a good mixture in the room, number five, I see number five coming up a lot, scholarship, 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 so you have to wait till the end, I saved the best for last, you have to sit through the whole presentation to get your scholarship tips, but um, I'm gonna proceed. I'm glad you're here and I hope by the end of this, you would get some, everybody will get something out of it. So before I get into the nuggets, let me tell you why this. I even started talking about this college readiness and why it became a problem. So in, in the nation, right now, everybody graduates high school. Most of the time you get accepted to some university, but very quickly, high school students are leaving the colleges. So after year one, we've noticed that one in three students do not make it back to second year. This is national statistics. Another problem in the universities is that bachelor's degree takes four years to complete. Now it's taking more and more students, 62% students to graduate in six years. They are taking six years to finish the bachelor's degree. And another problem is students who are graduating and they're not finding jobs. So this is what's happening in our universities today. And I've seen this firsthand, you know, and I realized that part of it is because students coming in, they are not very much aware. If you went to high school here, most of the time, nobody's really teaching you about college and how it works and what to expect and the courses, how to, all the freedom you get, some students don't know what to do with it. And unfortunately, the lack of guidance and mentorship, you're on your own. Some people don't know what's going on and they end up flunking out of classes, dropping out, switching majors, confused in the system. And so I noticed that there's a gap between high school and college. And that's why I wanna share this information. So before you even go to college, one important thing you have to do is to analyze or understand your background. So in America, in Ghana, you know, you can go to school where you choose to go to school, depending on how much money you have, you can take your kids to any school. In America, we go to school where we live, okay? We go to school in our neighborhoods where we live, you automatically put in that school system, good or bad. So the problem that I'm seeing, it's actually higher for first generation college students and minorities, Blacks, Hispanics. We are leaving the schools at a higher rate than other nationalities. So the problem is why are we seeing this 
in our race more than others? And the quick answer, there's so many problems, but the quick answer is our K through 12 background education. When I came to America, I lived in the Bronx. I went to school in the Bronx. I had no clue the quality of my high school. I didn't know. Um, I just went to a high school and I thought it's a good school, you know. I, I didn't know the background of my high school until later, later on. I found out that I was underprivileged. The high school that I went to isn't, wasn't a good high school. I did not even know that until I went to college and you're sitting in classroom with people from different high schools. And it's like these people are getting the thing and you're confused because you never were exposed to it in high school. I had no clue. So your K through 12 background is critical for your college success. That's where you spent majority of your school years. And so if you notice, you know, the people who know this trick, they will live in neighborhoods with better school systems because they know the land and they know the tricks. And some of us immigrants or um, low income families, we tend to live in areas with unfortunately poor school districts. Um, school district is dictated by money. So the more expensive the, the area, the better your public school system, you know, because private school in America is crazy expensive. So we all, majority of students go to public schools, but all public schools are not the same. Okay. So if you have to understand your child's K through 12 background, and I'll show you how to look up your background. So bef this before you even go to college, you have to do all of this search. You have to understand your K through 12 so that you can pick the right school that matches your, your school. It doesn't mean that, you know, if you're coming from a bad school, so to speak, you won't get into college. That's not the point. Retention is my focus. Acceptance, everybody will get accepted to some college. It's the retention and graduation is the problem. Okay, so how do you search your school background? It's on Google. Every state, they rank the schools and then they look at certain numbers. So I'm showing an example here based on Ohio schools. So I just, if you Google school ranking, high school ranking in New York, all the schools will come up. High school ranking in New Jersey, Ohio. Do it per your state. So they'll do the ranking based on the, your state and based on the nation. I want you to pay attention to two numbers, graduation rates, and something called college readiness scores. So they score the students in the district based on test scores. So we have all these state tests that they do from you know, elementary, they'll do the state test, high school, you have all these state tests and they use that to measure the quality of your school. So this is a school in Ohio, it ranks number four in the state of Ohio, very, very good school, affluent neighborhood, Okay, and their college readiness is 83.5. As compared to a different school in Ohio, ranks around 400, their graduation rate is low, their college readiness is less than 10%, less than 10%. Because kids there, to get them to graduate is even a problem. So they are not ready for college. And therefore, if you take this kid, even the number one kid in that school and put them in, let's say, Ohio State, this kid will automatically struggle because they have not been pushed. They have not been exposed because their school quality is very, very low. So there are strategies you will use for a student like this compared to a student like this. You know, no matter how good they are, you have to pass them through a test and make sure they're ready for college because their school numbers is alarming. So quickly, I would say for somebody like this, you recommend a small school, a community college starts here. Let's make sure you're ready before you go into a big school. Otherwise you'll quickly um, be weed out of the school. There's a weed out system that's going on in colleges that nobody would tell you. But your kid go in, they'll quickly weed them out and they are gone. 
And so you have to look up your K through 12, understand where you're coming from. So I'm gonna use my school as an example. I was fortunate, even though I went to the Bronx, my school wasn't so bad. It was a new school, it was called Collegiate Institute for Math and Science. I was very, very fortunate to go into this school. It was a new school in the Bronx, kind of like a charter school. And I was able to graduate from there. Even though I was the top of my class, look at the college readiness of my school, 46%. So when I went to undergrad, I thought I was number one in my high school, number two. So I'm going to, high school was easy for me. So I thought college would be easy for me too. But quickly was I put in my right place because I went to a very good college, Binghamton University. So it had top students come there. And now somebody that was ranking number two in my high school didn't have to try hard, didn't even have to study hard. All of a sudden, my first test comes, I have a 60%. I'm like, oh my goodness, I've never seen a 60% before. But quickly, I had to, you know, wake up, study hard, all that good stuff. But even me, I schooled in Ghana, so I at least had study skills in Ghana. Ghana's um, K through 12 is more rigorous than America K through 12, most of the American schools, not all of them, most of them. Ghana, you know, from class one, you start, they put you on your toes very early. So I went to class one all the way through JSS in Ghana. So I would say I had background. That's what helped me succeed in Binghamton. Otherwise, I would have been on the bottom very, very quick. I knew how to study by the grace of God, even though in America and my high school, I didn't really study that much, but I took BC in Ghana. So if you study BC for, for BC in Ghana, you know how to study because you know how to open books and study. Anyway, so that helped me prepare for college. So when I went, although I initially struggled, I was able to find my foot very, very quick and I was able to stay afloat. <laughs> So let me tell you what happens in the classroom when different students come into the classroom. Their background makes a difference. I have seen this firsthand over and over and over again. Students with good high school backgrounds, first semester, they are pulling A's and B's. Students from poor backgrounds, poor uh, school systems, they are struggling with especially math and science, STEM. So the chemistries, the biologies, the calculuses, people are flunking out first semester, they're getting Ds, Es, and Fs. And um, in college, GPA is huge, as we are aware. So in order to stay in status, you have to have a GPA of 2.0 or better, 2.0 or better. I have seen students get below 2.0. I have seen grades as low as 0.9. So you would think 2.0, that's easy. I can get 2.0, that's for you. But for some students, they cannot even get 2.0, okay? So if you don't get 2.0, you will go on academic probation, you will be suspended. So sometimes our kids will go to college and they'll come back home, they won't tell you why. Some of them will let go. In high school, they won't let you go. You stay as you are until you graduate. No child left behind. So everybody graduates. In college, I'm afraid they won't give you the degree if you don't meet the requirements. So when you start getting poor grades, your GPA drops very, very much. Even if you get some A's, getting one D alone will ruin your GPA. And some students are not even able to get a 2.0. Sadly, 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 it's happening over and over and over and over again. That's why they leave. Some people get frustrated. That's why one in three students don't make it back to year two. After year one, they're like, I can't do this. Forget this. I'm done. I'm gone. I'm leaving. And so they quit. But if they have a mentor, if they have a coach, if they have direction, they have a plan, they will be able to do better. So that's what I do for my students. I, I weigh your background. I look at your strengths. I pick the right program for you, the right school. Every school is not good for everybody. Just because you've been accepted doesn't mean you should go there. Sometimes it's actually okay to start from a community college. In our community, we look down on community colleges, but there's nothing wrong with 
going to a community college to make sure that you're ready before you go to a four-year college. You can transfer later to a four-year college. So there are students I coach, I tell them, listen, this pandemic didn't help you, didn't study anything for three years. Don't go to college right now. Don't go to a four-year right now. Let's start at a community college. Let's prove that you have the skill set to be successful. Otherwise, they'll take your money. If you take loans, you still have to pay for it, even if you don't graduate. One student told me, this from a different school, told me that they didn't attend their first semester and they are being charged. I said, but you registered for the classes. Even if you don't show up to the classroom, you will pay every dime because you registered for the class. If you don't pass, you get an E, you will still pay for that class. If you take a loan, they'll collect it back. So why do that? Most of the time, community colleges will be free. So why don't you go and start for free? Make sure you're okay before you transplant. Every school, every student is not ready for a four-year college right away, but you have to know yourself and pick the right school so that you don't, this should not happen to you. So now that you've done your analysis and you know your high school, you understand your academic strengths, you're about to pick a college. What's the best college? Where should I go? There are 5,000 universities plus in America. In Ghana, we used to struggle to find universities. Here, don't worry, there's university in every state. So many, you will get in somewhere. So now all these schools, different school sizes. So I've categorized the schools to big, medium, and small based on population. So big is like 20,000 people or more. Those are big, big state schools. Like my state, my school right now is 50,000 people. That's a huge school. Then we have medium size. My undergrad was medium size, 11,000 people. Then we have small schools. A lot of people avoid small schools. Most of the times people are picking all the big state schools. While that may be good for student A, it may not be good for student B. So where should I apply? And then also we have schools like um, two-year colleges, four-year colleges, private schools, public schools, in states. We have predominantly white universities. We have historically black universities, a lot of options. You can apply anywhere in America in the 50 states and somebody will accept you. So where should you start? How do you know where to go? Most of the time, I advise that you start from your state, the state that you live in. Most of the time, it will be cheaper to go in state than out of state. So you're trying to save money. Start from your state, right? And then I tell students to apply to the three categories, big, medium, or small. It's good to apply to different types of schools because when the offer letter comes, you will know, you know which one is a good you will do some research also before you apply, but it's good to apply to different kinds of school. You shouldn't apply to just big state schools. It's not a good idea. Apply to some small schools. In fact, in fact, retention, staying in college and graduating is higher for smaller schools because the professor to student ratio is small. If you go to big schools, you are in a class with 500 people. You're not used to that. In high school, you don't take a class with 500 people. But if you go to a big school, most of your introduction classes will be 500 people, 600 people in one big lecture hall. Nobody cares about you. You are just like a, a peanut in the classroom. But if you go to a small school, 24 students, one professor, they are able to know you. They're able to pay attention to you. If you're not doing well, they're able to reach out to you. So I actually recommend small schools for people, especially those of us coming from not so good high schools. You'll be better off in a small school. But guess what? The small schools tend to be private. And so we are like, hey, it's too expensive. I'm not going to a private school. It's $50,000. Trust me, private schools give a lot of scholarships. People don't know this. Private, small private schools, the Catholic schools, the Methodist schools, the Presbyterian colleges, they give a lot of sponsorship. 
So don't be afraid that a private school says 50,000, nobody pays 50,000 to go there. I guarantee you, even the people whose parents make million dollars, every single individual will get scholarship. So don't be afraid because the school's ticket price is 60,000. So you say, hey, 60,000, they mean to me. Let me apply to 20,000 or 10,000. The 10,000 people, they don't give scholarship. So <laughs> some of them don't. So apply to private schools, apply to small schools. I recommend small and medium. Large schools for a first degree, honestly, it takes some special grace to be able to survive in a big school. So spread it around and see what the offers are. Don't be afraid. Apply to some historically Black universities. They are fine. They are fine. Um, so spread your wings within your states and let's see what happens. So after you've done your school research, <clears throat> you also have to, you know, there are some schools that offer certain majors. And so, for instance, if you want to do nursing, there are some schools that have nursing schools. It's better for you to go to a school that have nursing if you're trying to do nursing, for example. You know, some schools are good for certain um, programs. There are some schools that are good for business, schools that are good for accounting. If you go to those schools, it increases your chance to get a job after you graduate. You always have to think about a job when you are picking a school. So decide your career path. You have to know what you're trying to do. Decide, decide, decide. If you don't decide, you go to school, nobody's going to decide it for you. So do your research, ask your questions, visit the campus, do whatever it takes to know which track you're going to. Are you going to the healthcare routes? Are you going to the law routes? Are you going to... IT routes, you have to decide those things before you start. It helps you to stay focused because you've done your research. You know exactly what you want to do. Don't just go to school. A lot of students come, I'm undecided. You will be in the school for six years. I'm telling you, easy, easy. Undecided students take longer to graduate. They make the most mistakes. They take classes that they don't need. They waste the most money. So if you're trying to finish in four years, you have to decide in high school before you go to college. In Ghana, in high school, they made us, you can pick your major, whether you're a science student or home economics, it helps. By the time you get to university, you know that this is what I like, this is what I don't like. Here in high school, most people don't specialize. So students get confused and they don't know what to do. So you have to decide your college so that you can pick you have to decide your career so you can pick the college. And if you decide your career, sometimes, you know, maybe a traditional four-year university is not for you. Maybe you should go to trade school. For instance, if you want to be a, a chef, you don't need to go to a, a traditional four-year college. You can go to a culinary school. If you want to be an electrician, you don't need to go to a traditional four-year school. You can go to a trade school. If you want to be a plumber, you. If you want to be a beautician, you can go to cosmetology school. You don't need to waste four years in college, take all these loans, only to come back to do, you know, hair. There's nothing wrong with doing hair. There's nothing wrong with being a plumber. You just have to decide it early so you don't go and, um, and take loans for a degree you're not going to use. So the earlier you decide your career, it helps you when you're planning for college. A lot of people don't know what to do. They're like, I have no clue. I'm 18. I'm 17. I don't know what to do. It's okay. There are predictive tools that you can use to predict, you know, what you're good at. Sometimes you don't even know, but thank God for technology. You, they can pass you through a predictive tool and they can predict some careers for you, for instance. It'll ask you questions. Do you like to build cabinet? I said, no, I don't like to build cabinet. So it'll ask, do you like to do this? Do you like to do that? And after you answer the question, it can predict some careers for you and maybe to give you a clue. So there are things you have to do before you start school so you're not, unfortunately, you don't want to be clueless. So for instance, when I did this test, it predicted, I did it for fun. It predicted me as a chemist. It predicted 
for me as a health informatics specialist. So if you look at it, it wasn't very far off from what I do. I'm a chemist by training. So it's all, it predicted me as a science person, which is great because that's really what I am. So these predictive tools, they help you to really decide. So nobody should go to undergrad undecided. As a parent, if your child says I'm undecided, you should be scared because in, in college, nobody will decide for them. They are on their own. Nobody will help them decide. So please help them. Please help them. Please help them decide what to do before they go. All right. So after you've decided, when you decide, everything becomes so clear. You pick the right schools. You know what to do. You know how long it takes to get that career. For instance, if you pick a medical doctor, you know, I need to get my bachelor's degree. Then I need to go to medical school. Then I have to do my residency. So it helps you plan your track. If you decide I want to be a physician assistant, you know, I need a bachelor's first then I need a master's. I'm done. You know, if you want to be a nurse practitioner, you know, first I need to get my BSN and I'm going to go to master's and do nurse practitioner. So it helps you pick your major, helps you plan your track. As far as majors are concerned, there's so many in the books. Again, I always encourage people to pick a major that's within their strengths. I believe when God made you, when Bible says when you were in your mother's womb, I knew you. God knew us from our mother's womb. So ask the Lord from zero to 18, God should reveal to you what your strengths are. Or you should know from zero to 18, which is kindergarten all the way to high school, you should know your strengths. You should know, you should know, you should know. So pick your major based on your strengths um, because you will shine where you're good at. For instance, me, I always tell my husband, he's an accountant, I'm a scientist. I tell him, if you put me in an accounting classroom, I'm going to get Fs and Ds. No, like, that's not, that's not me. I, give me science, give me equations, let me calculate, I'm done. That's me. And so you have to know you very well so you can pick your major. Otherwise, you're going to be doing, I start history today, I stop, I start business today, I stop. I am of the opinion that's, it doesn't matter what you do. You have to be good at it. If you're good at it, you will get a job. And if you prepare, in fact, let's say they are picking 10 historians to do the best history job in America. And you are so good, you're top five. If they are picking 10, you're top five, you will get in, you'll be one of the 10. Why not? You have to be that good for people to want you. So me, I'm not afraid for students to, dream and pick a major that's unconventional, not traditional. I'm okay with that. As long as you show me that you will commit to the work that it takes to be the best artist. You will show me, you will give me the work to be the best English graduate in the university. Then every company wants you, every writing firm wants you because you are that good. That's how you have to be. So pick something that will make you shine. You'll be so good at it that everybody wants you. Then, you know, that's where you do the best. You do the best um, when you're doing your career of your interest. So yeah, I need to move. Time is going, my goodness. And then um, curriculum so you have to look at the school's curriculum, the program that you, look, you are going to apply to. For instance, if you want to do nursing, some schools require, to, require you to do calculus for nursing. Other schools will not require you to do calculus. So you have to investigate the curriculum, what the requirements are, and pick one that's good for you. So quickly, a nursing curriculum as an example, this school to get a bachelor's in nursing, it requires one semester of chemistry. Another school to get a bachelor's of nursing, same nursing degree requires two semesters of chemistry. So if you're a student, you don't like chemistry, maybe you should pick school A because it only will put you through one semester. So that's what I mean by curriculum review. All of this is on the university's website. You can always Google bachelor's curriculum Ohio State physics curriculum. You just Google it, it's on the university's website and you can research it for yourself. Or you can hire somebody to do it for you. So you've researched, you know your school, you know your major, you have to apply. 
Application process is usually, to me, that's the easiest part. Um, you need your college essays. Everybody applies on this website. It's a common app. That's where you're going to put in your um, schools. It's a one platform. It'll submit your application to different schools. You know, you have to do your test scores, SAT, ACT, depending on your state. You have to apply for financial aid. You have to look for scholarship. That's all the process before you start college. So when should you start this process? Your junior year is the latest you should start. The earlier, the better. 10th grade is really good to start looking at your SATs, your SATs. But junior year, that's college application season. That's when you should be, you should have your list of schools, you should have your essay topics, you should look up your financial aid, all that good stuff. Junior year, that's the timeline for it. Most of the time, application opens up in August. So August 1st, applications will open up. And that's when, if you've done your homework in junior year, senior year, application opens, you are putting your information in the system because you've already done all the work. Because some deadlines happen early in your 12th grade. I'm going to talk briefly about something called early assurance program. A lot of people don't know about this. If you want to go to medical school, medical school, it seems like it's such a hard school to get into. It's not true. You can get in. There's something called early assurance program. When you are in high school, you apply to medical school. You get accepted to the medical school and then they'll tell you first go and get your bachelor's and then come. So they've given you an early assurance for medical school. I didn't know about this. So you apply for early assurance to medical school, pharmacy school, some programs have this. If you have your SAT scores, you are a good student in high school, you wanna be a medical doctor, you should look up early assurance medical school programs. They have it in different states. And you will apply to the medical school. You will get accepted as a high school student. And then you go and get your bachelor's degree and come in. So you don't have to worry when everybody else is worrying after their bachelor's. You already have a seat in medical school before you even start undergrad. It's all over the state, but you won't know about this. So this is one of the secrets. Early assurance program, look into it. That's why if you know what you want to do early, you can take advantage of all these opportunities and you don't waste time and you don't struggle for no reason. I have students came in, they're like, I'm going to medical school. I'm like, you're a freshman. How are you going to medical school? It's like, oh, I already have acceptance to medical school. That's when I even... As a professor, it was the first time I found out about Elia Shora's program. Guess what? It was all white and Indian kids. I never met one Black person in my classroom who has gotten Elia Shora's. It was Chinese, Indians, and white people. They knew about this. They won't tell us in, in, in our schools. Anyway, so nowadays, People are wondering, some schools don't require you to report your SAT scores and your ACT scores. So some students have heard this and they don't wanna take the exam. Wrong idea, take your SATs, take your ACTs. You have to take it, guess what? If you take it, they will use it to give you scholarship. Every student is coming to the school. How can, I, how can we give you scholarship if you don't set yourself apart? So if people are not doing the test, you do the test. You get a good score. You will get full ride scholarships like crazy. So if you're looking for scholarships, please put your child to SAT test, ACT test from ninth grade. Let them get an SAT book, ACT book, and start doing SAT prep from ninth grade. By the time they get to junior year, that's when they will take this test and they, they'll be prepared so they can score high percentiles. That's when Harvard will be writing to you. Columbia will be writing to you. Stanford universities, they'll be writing to you because your test scores are excellent. So please take your test scores. It'll get you more money to get you into the best schools, the best programs. 
It's like your bragging rights. Students who test well on these tests, they prove to the nation that they are the best students. So please take your SATs, take your um, ACTs. Depending on your state, some states do SAT, some states do ACT. Encourage your child to take it, even though it says it's optional. It's a trick. It's a trick to give the smart people money. So take the test. Essays, usually you have to write an essay. I encourage students to write essay based on their strengths, the talents they have. If your child is in high school, get them involved in community events, get them involved in church events, soup kitchens, get them do things other than school work. You don't want to write an essay just based on your schoolwork. I have a 4.0 GPA. That's great. So what? Everybody else have 4.0 GPA from high school. So you want to show up with added strength. Are you a choir leader? Are you a youth leader? Are you volunteering? Are you doing internships? That kind of stuff is where the money is at. Remember, to get money, you have to be not your average student. You have to be exceptional. Nobody will give you money if you are not exceptional, unfortunately. If people want to give you money, they are looking for the top students, the best students to support them. So show that you are good with your GPA, show that you are good with your SAT, show that you are good with your community involvement. Then you see the money flying out. They don't tell you these money. It'll just show up on your financial aid office, your, your financial aid office. All of a sudden, this scholarship, Yale scholarship, this scholarship, this scholarship, people have donated money. And they've said to the universities, give it to a student who is black, who plays sports, who has a 3.5 GPA. And so the moment you are that student, automatically you get the scholarship. You don't even have to apply for it. So high school is a really good time to embellish yourself. That's why I'm so particular about high school students and coaching them, because that's your time. That's your time to shine. Not when you are an undergrad. That's by that time, the people who are getting their rewards, they've already gotten it and you are late. So money, money is coming up. I promise you, I'm going to get through this quickly so you can ask your questions. I apologize. Time is going. Um, FAFSA. FAFSA is the free application for federal student aid. So everybody should apply for FAFSA, whether your parents make a million or your parents make 20K, apply for FAFSA. FAFSA, you have to be eligible. You have to be a U.S. citizen or permanent resident. You have to have a social valid, um, a valid social security. You have to have completed high school and then you'll be eligible. So it usually opens up October of your senior year, October of your senior year. And then you won't get the results until much, much later. Um, before you graduate your senior year, you would have gotten the offers so when you apply for financial aid, every school has a price ticket. Like I said, depending on your school, the price will be different. But don't be afraid of price. Just apply. Um, the financial aid office, the federal government will give you free money. When you apply, you will get offers. Some of the offers are free. You don't have to pay back. So Pell Grant is free. They call something institutional aid is free. And then state aid is free. Scholarships is free. So you apply, the schools will use your income, your merits, and they will give you a number. Say, Jeanette, here's 40,000 for you. Here's 10,000 for you. It really depends on your income and your merits. Merits, whether sports scholarship, instrument scholarship, the schools will give these ones to you, no problem. It's calculated based on family contribution, your income. So if you are high income, does that mean you shouldn't apply? False, apply, because some of the institutional aids may not be based on your income. The federal government one is totally based on income, but there are other aids that universities offer that is not based on income. It can be based on your merits, your SAT scores, your GPA. So apply for it. Um, then FAFSA also gives loans. So the federal government will give you loans. They give you free money. 
then let's say your school costs 40,000, you got 30,000 for free, you still owe 10,000. So that 10,000, the federal government can give you loans, which is cheaper than private loans. So if you're trying to take loans for your child, please apply for parents plus loans. It's from the federal government and it's cheaper. If there's recession, the federal government can say nobody should pay their loans. You're free. It's not private loan. So I don't recommend private loans. I recommend you get scholarships and free money. I don't recommend loans at all. That's why I recommend that your, the students should be really academically good so that you get all the aids. Some schools will give you full ride. You don't even have to think about loans if you are good. But let's say you are good, but still you didn't get full ride. They give you free 30,000. There's 10,000 left. You don't want to take loans. What should you do? Private scholarship, external scholarship outside the university. The first set of scholarships that I talked about, these ones come from the institutions. You don't have to apply for this. The institution have the money, they will give it to you. The external one, that one, you go out there into America and you look for it. Bring it to your school. They will add it to your offer and subtract. So this part, people don't do. A lot of people apply for financial aid and that's it. They don't want to do this one because this one requires work, research, searching, finding it. People don't want to do this one because it's private. You're on your own. It's external. You have to do it. Some churches give scholarships. It would be considered private loan, private scholarships. So where can you find private scholarships? Private scholarships are all over the nation. There are big amounts, small amounts, and then any amounts. Now, there are scammers online. Let's say you just go to Google and say private scholarships for college. You will get a lot of hits. You should be careful, though. Not all the websites are legit. There are verified companies who give scholarships every year. Coca-Cola, Bill Gates. Those ones are very competitive. They require essays. You have to write essays. You have to tell your community, your community experience, your involvement in community, traveling to Ghana to some homeless, um, to some underprivileged community and doing something or doing something for homeless people. That's the stuff people want to hear. So if you are competitive, they'll give you the scholarship. And that one, look, it'll cover everything. <laughs> Some, some of them are very, very big, but those are very competitive. So I encourage like the small scholarship amount. People don't want this because they're like, oh, 5,000. What am I doing with 5,000? I don't want to apply to 5,000. Apply, apply to small dollar amounts. Even if it's 1,005, apply. Because you can use that 1,005 to buy books, okay? So apply to many small scholarships within your state. The scholarship within your state. You can go to your local library, local library and say, please, what are the scholarships for this state of New Jersey in this library? Tell me. They have a list. Libraries have a list. They have books with local scholarships. They are sponsored only to people in New Jersey. That one is way better than fighting for the one that's in the whole nation. So doing local state by state scholarship is really the best. Some website you should avoid, like Fast Web, they'll say no essays required. Whenever you see a scholarship that says no essay required, it's called lazy scholarship. Don't do it. You will not get it. They'll collect your information and throw it and use it for whatever they want to use it for. It's spam. So I don't recommend no essay scholarships. It says no essay required. And you two, you think it's easy. Oh, let me just put my name and email, please. Nobody will give you money for doing nothing. <laughs> so you have to do essays. Sometimes you, they even require recommendation letters. Those are the ones you want to apply to. Those are legit because somebody wants to see that you're qualified. But students don't apply to private scholarships. It takes a lot of work to find them. And so they don't do it. I have some lists of websites 
and I can share this with pastor later because you won't have time to read, write all of this. I can share these free links for you if you're interested in looking at these websites. These websites tend to offer scholarship to African-American students in the nation. So the NAACP has scholarship. They have foundation for minorities. There's actually a lot of scholarships for minorities you know, not minorities in STEM, women in STEM, Black men in STEM, in engineering. You can look up, you know, scholarships. When you're using Google, you have to be a little bit specific. Um, scholarship for first-generation students in engineering. Then you will get a better hit. But these websites provide um, um, scholarship for minority students. Black students, Hispanics, first generation. So I would definitely recommend you look here if you're looking for scholarship. But this scholarship for everyone, you should apply to some for Black people. You should apply to some for first generation. You should apply to some for people who love music. They have scholarship for people who have a pet. You know, pet lover scholarship, for instance. This scholarship for so many different things. It's just that, where is it? you have to find it. So these are some of the websites that I trust that if you go there, it's not like going to collect your information. College Board has a scholarship tab under there. You can apply. There's a one called College Navigator, Brook Scholars, Shag, all of these. Like I said, if you want the list, I can provide it. Give me your email. I'll send you the list um, later so you can have all this information. But there are websites out there you just have to really search for it and apply so with all this said where should I go to school like I said who will give you the most money you wouldn't know you wouldn't know right now as of today that Columbia will give me the most money you wouldn't know you will only find out when the offer letter comes that's why I said apply to the Ivy Leagues apply to different kinds of schools when the offer comes you will be able to now be the one in charge you're like okay you want me you want me you want me let me see who's giving me the most money and I'll pick you and go to school so apply to the different category of schools black school white school private public four-year two-year apply in state even out of state I know somebody who got more money to go out of state from Ohio she went to Yale University She's Ohio resident. She applied to in-state, out-of-state. Yale gave her full ride. And she went to Yale University. So don't be afraid. I recommend in-state, but don't be afraid to apply to some of the out-of-state. It's free. Most of the time, applications are free. So apply and just put the school on there. So secrets no one tells you. Number one, historically Black universities actually have good retention for black students and minority. I think it makes sense. Black students retain better at black schools because they see people who look like them. In fact, in the nation, a lot of our black professors, black uh, doctors, um, African-American doctors, researchers, lawyers, they went to HBCU. Pamela, Harris, Kamala Harris, Kamala Harris, the um, what's it called? The vice president. She went to a historically black university. Parents are afraid of African parents are afraid of historically black colleges in America because they think, oh, I don't know if my child is going to party or what. But actually, research back this. Students actually retain black students retain better in HBCUs than they do in in white schools. Um. Also, people say, oh, GPA is nothing. Don't worry about your GPA. It's not true. GPA is important. You get scholarships based on your GPA. Things happen for you if you have a good GPA. So please work on your GPA once you're in college. The first two years in college, the most critical. That's your weed out state. Universities are weeding out students. They say it's not intentional. I'm a university professor. So I think it's not intentional, but the first two years is where we lose most of our students. That's where we lose most of our students. That's why it's like so critical that you, you do well in your first two years. Otherwise you'll be let go. You'll be suspended. 
Um, where you go to school actually doesn't matter. People don't know this. People think I have to go to Ivy League to be successful. There's some truth to that, but you can go to a community college and be mm-hmm. successful. Mm-hmm. It's how well you do. It's not where you go. So you mm-hmm. want to do well. It's more important than going to Ivy League and being the lowest in the class. Mm-hmm. It won't help you. It's better you go to a community college and be the top in the class. It'll mm-hmm. help you. So where you go, honestly, it really doesn't matter. Um, you just have to be good. People say private schools are expensive. So I'm not going to go. It's not true. They give the most institutional mm-hmm. scholarships. So don't worry about private schools. It looks expensive, but it's not. So you can apply there. Um, being undecided is a terrible thing. I think I've said this. Don't do it. Decide. Do whatever it takes to decide. Um, before you go to school, do all the research, visit the campus, go talk to professors, do whatever it takes to decide before you go. Otherwise, you'll be in there for too long, wasting time and money. So by the way, I want to throw this in there, shameless plug. I am a coach. I do help students get ready for college. So especially high school students, um, because those are my babies. They have to get ready for college. So I'm enrolling 11th graders. 12th graders is getting a little bit late, but 11th grade, if you're interested in my program, you can reach out to me. 9th grade and 10th grade, currently I don't have a program for you. you. But, you know, that's the time to really build your academic strengths. So your parents can help you at that stage. And then 11th grade, you can find me. I have students I'm coaching. They are in school right now. They're doing excellent. Um, so if you go to my website, you'll see the reviews of my clients. If you want to find me, I'm not very hard to find. I have a phone number right here. I also have a website. You can find me there. And that's my email. You can take a screenshot of this. If you need my information later on, you can always book a free 15 minute consultation on my website. You'll find the, my available times. You can book 15 minutes to talk to me for free. And then I can give you some guidance. So thank you so much for listening. Our time is fast spent. I went over my time, but that's because I have so much to share. And see, I, I think I am done with presenting the information, but I'm able to stay to answer questions that you you have. Thank you, Pastor Bediakon. I think you can take over right now. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you very much. I will let um, Elder Aminya take over. Pastor, actually, he wanted me to take over because he was having some connection uh, issues. Oh, okay. Sure, go ahead. Well, first of all, we want to thank you, uh, Dr. Janet Entry. I mean, everything you said, everything that you mentioned, I've experienced it. I mean, I've seen people, Ghanaian kids, with less than 1.0 GPA being kicked out of the school. Even after being put on probation with some assistance from some other, other students to help them through it, they were, they were still kicked out. So everything that you said is on point, and we thank you for this insight, uh, especially for our parents you know, who have kids, like you said, in the 9th, 10th, and 11th grade, or 12th grade, you know, who are about to go to college. And then, you know, you ask them in church, so what are you thinking about? What are you going to do? And they have no idea. Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to open it up for questions and answers, you know, maybe four or five minutes of it. And then we'll wrap things up. We know we, we are beyond our time now. So four to five minutes of questions for, to our uh, doctor entry, and then uh, we'll wrap things up. Anybody? Yeah, has I, have, any I have a question for the please. Yeah, is there any need to consider the issue of morality and uh, when trying to choose? Um, my son, uh, my message bomb is wondering. Mystic. All right. So, is Please there repeat to... your question. I'm sorry. Yeah, is there a need to consider the issue of morality when selecting these various schools? Uh, what do you mean by the some... issue of morality, please? Some of the perceptions we hear about the black schools in quotes. Oh, yeah. Okay. 
That's right. Okay, so the issue of morality, unfortunately, is in every school. Black or white. Um, I guess it's minimal. That's why I like small schools. It's it tends to be minimal at small liberal arts, religious schools, or the Catholic schools, the Methodist schools, those those schools, you know, um, because of just the sheer smallness of the school, thousand two people. It doesn't even really increase. It's true. You have to look at the, the, the party schools and all that. But I went to a school that was a party school. If your child is is really fully aware of who they are, you can go to the school and never participate in anything. So I'm not afraid because I focus on my child and trusting them and knowing that I have really equipped them. Um, because those things, unfortunately, in this day and time is everywhere. Black school, white school. It's in the places that you least expect. So if you want to consider that, then you probably will have to have your child commute and come home every day. But living on in the dorms, black or white, it's usually tricky. Um, so some parents have chosen to let their children commute, go and come back home because they feel they feel that's safer. That's okay too. But the issue of morality is really hard because these schools they hide. You won't find the red flags when you visit them. They do these parties mm -hmm. off campus, really is not on campus. So if your child stays on campus, they will be safe and secure. It all happens off campus. And so that one, you really don't have control over that. Doc, I have a question for you. Go ahead. Um, Two part question. So do you do coaching to um, kind of, um, lead or help these kids uh, find out what they would be good at? Yes. And my, and my second part is, what if the person already went to college and either it's on academic probation or has been kicked out? Do you also do a, a coaching how to get them back on track or what would be your advice? Okay, very good question. I love this question. Yes, I help students figure it out. That's if you enroll my coaching program, the first sessions is literally helping you figure it out. I put you through all the tests, all the screening I have, all the measures. I know how to get you to bring that out of you. So I do that. Secondly, if you're already in college and say you've been suspended or um, you are currently struggling, you can't bring out the GPA, I can help you, but there's easy way to fix it. You kind of have to start all over again. You have to start, scrap the first routes and start all over again. The good news in America is somebody else will accept you to their university, even though you didn't make it in one university. You can start all over and apply, write an essay saying, I know what I did wrong. I am go I have fixed my life. I've changed it and reapply and start clean from a better school that fits you with now you're almost going to start like a high school coming into college. You have to scrap and start. So transfer school start all over. That's the easy way to do it. Staying in one school to fix a GPA that's 1.2 will take you eight years to do. It's not recommended. If your GPA is that low, the earlier you exit that school, the better it will be for you. You got to, when you go to a different university, you start all over again in terms of building your GPA. When you stay in the same university, they will accumulate your GPA. So they'll add the 1.5 to your two and three, and it still pulls it down. When you go to, you leave University A, go to University mm -hmm. B, you have a clean state, clean slate. You start all over again. So that student needs direction, needs focus, needs motivation, needs coaching, then they can start all over again. But there's always a second chance. It's not too late. They can start all over. Yeah, hello. Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah, please go I ahead. Have, I have a question. Go ahead, please. Can I go ahead? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. My my question is uh we go to school so that in the future we will get a good job. That's right. And take care of our families. Absolutely. Okay. 
And uh, most of the courses that are being offered in our universities mm -hmm. makes it very difficult mm -hmm. to find a job after graduation. Mm -hmm. Me, for instance, I graduated, uh, I had my first degree in Ghana mm -hmm. in economics. Right. Uh, I came to the United States mm -hmm. and I wanted to uh, go higher with my degree mm -hmm. in economics. Mm -hmm. But after mm -hmm. doing some research, I realized that pursuing higher degree in economics mm -hmm. wouldn't make me much money than uh, than I, I I expect. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I diverted into a different uh, program, mm -hmm. which is engineering. Okay. And luckily, uh, most of the courses that I did in my bachelor's was related to mathematics. Okay. So I had a good background in mathematics. Mm -hmm. So that qualified me mm -hmm. into uh, pursuing my master's in, uh, in engineering, which mm -hmm. I did. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, I'm benefiting from it. So, so my question to you is mm -hmm. uh, yeah. there are a lot of programs like okay. i said earlier there are a lot of programs in bachelors uh, uh, in, uh at the universities so do you advise people to accept any program that they are being offered oh, okay at the bachelor's level all right irrespective of whether it would be easy for mm -hmm. them to get a job after graduation or not. Okay, good question. This is what I do. I focus on career, not a degree. I focus on career first. So if a student comes to me and they say they want to do economics, economics is I'm just using economics as an example, please, no offense. Economics is not a job necessarily. It's a program. So if you come to me, you say you want to study economics. What are you trying to do with economics? We have to figure that one out first because a degree is not a job. People confuse degrees with job. Some degrees equals to a job. Some degrees does not equal to a job. So if you say you want to study psychology, psychology is not a job. What are you trying to do? Do you want to be a clinical psychologist? Do you want to be a therapist? That's the job. We have to figure that one out before we backtrack to go do a degree. Most of the time, people start with a degree before they think about a career. Wrong way to do it. You have to pinpoint the career you are targeting before you start the degree. So if you come to me, you say you want to do English, no problem. My second question, please, so what are you trying to do with the English degree? Do you want to be a teacher? Do you want to be a writer? Do you want to be a poet? Those are jobs. Then if you say, I want to be a poet, I'm going to ask you, where do poets work? Do you know where they work? Do you know how much they make? Do you know the degree that it takes to be a poet? What are the top five poets you know? If you can't answer any of these, my friend, change your mind. You don't know what you're talking about. So you have to prove to me that you know exactly the end goal before you start the beginning. If you don't know the end goal, don't come to me just dreaming in space. It has to be tangible. When I majored in chemistry, people asked me, what do you want to do with chemistry? Easy. I want to be a professor or I want to work in industry as a pharmaceutical scientist. That's a job. Chemistry is not a job. Okay, great. 
what does it take to be a pharmaceutical scientist? You need a PhD. So plan to get a bachelor's, then a PhD, you're going to get a job. So that's the way to do it. Unfortunately, people just launch into it without answering the questions, without figuring it out. Where are you going to work? Are you going to work at a school? Are you going to work at a bank? Are you going to create your own job? You know, you have to answer all of these before you even embark on the journey. And if you're not ready, take a year off and figure it out. It's okay to take a year off between high school and undergrad before you go and make all these mistakes and come back home unemployed. That's why 53% of people are unemployed. They don't even know what they want to do. How is somebody going to employ you? You have no idea. You meet those people. You say, what are you trying to do? They don't even know. So nobody's going to hire you. But if you know what you want to do, somebody will hire you. I promise you that. People so, uh, so at that age, it's very difficult to know exactly what you want to do. Uh, right. Me, for instance, uh, with, with, with my story, I was mm -hmm. around 17, 18 years. That's right. So I didn't know much about what I want to do in the future. Right. So the program was available for me and I went ahead and did it without That's knowing right. the prospect, without knowing the uh, prospect ahead of me. Right. So with this new case, it's going to yeah. be very difficult for them to know exactly what they want to do in the future. Let me like tell even, you. Even one, yeah. one thing is people, people uh, embark on certain programs and after graduate, uh, graduating from that program, they will never practice whatever they uh, learned in right. college. Mm -hmm. That's right? there. That that happens. It happens every every time. It does. But should it happen for you? I don't think so. If you are 17 and you don't know, there is research. There's shadowing. I've had students, this girl, she said, I don't know what research scientists do. I want to shadow you and see what it is that you do. You want to shadow somebody. You want to intern. There are internships for high school students. When I was in high school, I was able, this is America. Fortunately for us, we have opportunities, but sometimes we don't take advantage of it. There are job shadowing opportunities for high schoolers. There are some things you can do as a high school student. I did botany in high school. I went to a farm. I did. I went to a hospital to shadow doctors. I realized medical doctor is not for me. There are opportunities sitting in our churches. There are so many people in our churches who have figured it out. Why is that as a young person, you cannot ask uncle, uncle, what do you do? So we're not inquisitive enough. We're not asking questions. We're not searching enough because sometimes you don't have to make the mistake to learn. By the grace of God, we have people who have gone ahead of us and we can do our cross and check. Ask him, auntie, a pharmacist, what do you do? Your nurse practitioner, what's that? Students are not curious enough. If you are, you can even just go to YouTube. What does a cybersecurity person, what do they do? You find a video, somebody will tell you about it. So you don't need to wait to say that, oh, I'll figure it out. Personally, I don't like that approach. I will rather figure it out, whether through investigation, shadowing, you research, 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 read it on paper. If you don't like it on paper, you probably won't like it in practice either. Just read it, just Google it. What is, what is this thing? And figure it out, narrow it down. You will probably not know everything, but at least you will narrow it down. I always tell people, narrow it down to a field. Do you like healthcare? Do you like law? Do you like business? At least narrow it down to the niche. And then within business, maybe you don't know you want to be accountants or you want to be a business administration. That's better than saying, I know nothing. That one is red flag. <laughs> red Thank flag. you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Janet. I mean, this, this is awesome. This is really great. I just wanted to say something before we, we end. I brought us, you know, talking about the economics. I know for a fact that, you know, back home, sometimes 
you would choose something, but you don't get what you chose. You, you, they'll give you something that they think you can do. So I do appreciate where he's coming from. However, it's not like that here. If you can go, like you said, people go to college all the time saying, I'm undecided. You're not forced to choose a major or anything like that. So thank you so much. This is just the tip of the iceberg, right? If you have, you've heard that proverbial saying, if you see eyes on the water and if you think it's big, well, look again, look underneath the water. You see how big it is. So if you want more from Dr. Janet Entry, her website is there and it's very simple. Actually, it's just JanetEntry.com. Just put it in there. You find yeah. it. She, she will give you everything that you need, you know, for a little chump change. And uh, that's all it takes. It, I mean, it doesn't hurt to pay to have the right information. Um, um, there is this website that I wanted to chip in the Bureau of Labor Statistics. You go there, they have all the data of every career, projections of demand of that career for the next 10, 15, 20 years, projections of their salaries. It's all there. I mean, it's speak and you shall find. And I think I'll end it there. <laughs> um, Elda, Amenyo, do you have anything to say? Not right now. You said all oh, that uh, we need to have. And I think if there's anything at all, Professor Bejaku is there to take over and then hand over to you to end the program. Thank you. I think that we can wrap it up once again. We just want to appreciate um, Dr. Janet Enchi. Thank you so much for your time. I believe that has been very, very educative session. Um, knowledge is definitely power. Ignorance is always never excused. So um, let us take what we have gotten and I've shared her website. I think that when you go on the website, it is a lot of information there. If you guys want to have some um, private sessions and gather information, I think that is good. And uh, once again, thank you all for coming. The numbers has been great. And once again, Dr. Um, I appreciate it so much. It's been a long time. I can't wait to see you in person one of these days. And uh, I'll be that's... around this summer. I'll be in your area this summer. So I'll come please, to... please stop by, stop by, stop by. Let's thank hang you. out. I honestly want to thank you for this opportunity for everybody on this line. It's an honor to share um, these nuggets with you. So I hope you gain something. Thank you all for your time and your patience. I know I've gone over my time. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. doctor. Hello. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Uh... Can I have like two minutes to ask this question, please? It's not up to me. I'm not the whole... Yeah, it's up to the leadership. Yeah, yes, I understand please. that. It's if, up to the if, leadership. If, I'm if, asking if, the leadership. Is that okay with you? Oh, yeah, you are good. Are good. If only you oh, would okay. do two minutes. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah, in the company that I work for, right, we have a program for new uh, college graduates. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time, these uh, graduates don't actually know what they want to uh, achieve mm -hmm. in the future. So we have a program which is called uh, like new new college uh, hires. So okay. what this what this does is. Uh, it gives this uh, college students the opportunity mm -hmm. to go through different departments, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes they go through cy cyber security department. Mm -hmm. They go through programming department. They go through uh, uh, diff different 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 units of the company for for uh, one year. So after the one year, they decide which department they want to work for. And uh, before they decide, the other uh, managers from these departments will kind of uh, tell the company how much they contributed to the various department they work for within that one year so that they will know which area they are uh, they have my skill to work for 
So uh, what, what I'm trying to say is that these people come to the company without knowing exactly what they want to do, but the company helps them to choose a career path that they want to pursue. Okay, please, that's a contribution, I guess. It's not like a contribution. Okay, right. okay. Okay, thank you for that. I think you can share your company information and, and, and students can definitely take advantage of that. That would be great. All right, Dr. J, please take over. Okay, once again, thank you, Dr. Entry, and thank you all for you know bearing with us and uh, getting you know these pieces of knowledge. Um, without I don't think we have any other announcement. Look forward to our next month's uh, topic or leader, uh, you know, subject matter expert that we're going to bring to enlighten us, you know, as we journey through, you know, this world and as we prepare also to meet, you know, to for the, the second coming of Christ. Um, without anything else, any other announcements that we have? Where's the go, Pastor? I think that next month, Thursday, will be at Baltimore. So we will not be able to meet. Um, I think the 6th is a Thursday. That's the first Thursday of April. And that is when we are having the musical uh, worship night. So we want to encourage all of you to be there. Jometo is going to be there. We're going to have an amazing, amazing evening. We want to encourage all of you to try your best and join us April 6th. So we will not be having any life lessons April 6th, but definitely God willing, me, we will connect and we have amazing, amazing speakers line up for life lessons. Thank you. Thank you. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for this time of learning. Even though you, you said that for lack of knowledge, my people perish. Even for lack of knowledge in this world, we, we perish. We thank you for this opportunity to learn, with this opportunity to gather information for our children, for our own lives as well. We pray for the organizers, the, the leadership of the men's movement, anybody who contributed to this event. We pray that, Father, whatever they lost, that you replenish. We also pray committing and Dr. Janet entry into your hands, that, Father, this wonderful thing that she has started, you know, her consulting career, educating, coaching high schoolers, our children into becoming better citizens of this country, better citizens of the world. We pray that you help her to be successful, oh Lord. We pray that you open doors for her, that, you know, she'll be a blessing, not only unto us, but unto the bigger community, the bigger world as a whole, so that we have good citizens of this world who know you, who know Christ, who, who, who change the world for the better, who spread the gospel also. We thank you and we honor you. We pray that you keep us safe and you, until we meet again uh, in Baltimore, uh, April 6th, to, to, to celebrate the life, the death, and the resurrection of your son. We pray that you keep us together. Let us not hear any bad news, oh Lord. We pray, we pray for your protection. We pray that you go ahead of us, oh Lord. Let not the sun smite us during the day, nor the moon at night. We thank you and then we honor you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Let's share our, our motto and then Pastor uh, Bidiaku will give us the benediction. If ye be abiding my word, then are you my disciple. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and then you shall know the truth and the truth and the truth will set out to you free. Amen. Amen. I will receive the benediction. May Jehovah God keep you and your household. May he continue to cover you under his wings. May you never lack and may we exceed in his grace and his blood. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you all. God bless you all. Amen. Amen. God bless you too. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you for having me, Pastor Lydia. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you all. Bye-bye.
Bye. Bye.